Today, we're here to make public the laboratory test results, the scientific conclusions, the chain of evidence that, without a doubt, is one of the most extraordinary discoveries of our time. After a year and a half of intensive research, scientists throughout the United States conducted a battery of laboratory tests, which conclude that this material that you're now looking at appears to be manufactured structure and is extraterrestrial in origin. But we agree that at least one flying saucer crashed and was recovered with alien bodies by the U.S. government and carted away and that strong intimidation was done on witnesses. The planet Earth and the human race have apparently been under some kind of an ongoing long-term study, survey, or evaluation by several, and that's important to remember, several high-tech, off-planet, extraterrestrial civilizations. And then I realized what this thing was. Uh, they grabbed hold of me, the Air Force guy did. We got back in the golf cart and we were riding back up to the surface. And I was sitting there thinking, I just realized what this engine is. It's a symbiotic engine. The engine is alive. The general human population does not want to hear that another life form from somewhere else in this universe is collecting sperm and ova and creating hybrids when we as a planet have not even gotten to square one that we're not alone in the universe. For myself, there is absolutely no doubt this planet was visited by beings from outer space long, long time ago, and our young human race was influenced by it. A lot of the extraterrestrials exist in fourth dimensional reality or fifth dimensional reality. So what has happened is, has been that we are actually moving into their space. It's not that they, you know, are always on other planets. They come and go. They live, many of them, inside of our planet and exist simultaneous to us. You have a near-death experience or a shamanic experience when you come into contact with the visitors because it's so mind-blasting and overwhelming. Uh, we've had that experience on an individual basis. For, there are a couple of million people in the world who have had this experience. I think we're probably just about to have it on a general basis and the whole of mankind will be transformed. just won't go away. In fact, it keeps on building. According to a recent Gallup poll, 71% of Americans believe that the U.S. government knows more about UFOs than it is telling the public. Now that 50 years have passed, what do we really know about what happened here on that summer night in the skies over Roswell, New Mexico? It was the start of the biggest cover-up in history when a rancher named Mac Grazzle found some wreckage and debris. Stuff was so unusual that the army had to see. Major Jesse Marshall thought it wasn't from these parts. And when they plot to cover up, it's then the rumor starts. Ship skin was thin as foil, strong as steel. It's a fact. Couldn't cut star break or bend it. Couldn't dent it with an axe. Inside it were these ivies with some real strange encryptions, just like hieroglyphics or stuff written by Egyptians. Flying saucers been reported all across the 48, but who thought they'd hit the ground like a crumpled license plate? When the army realized just exactly what they found, they packed it up on great big trucks, quarantined the ground. Sent it to Rod Patterson, the Air Force Base of Choice. A little while later, and our government changed its voice. When the Army's press release first said a flying disc had crashed, now it's just a weather balloon that ended up all smashed. The whole thing sort of blew over till a few short decades later. The story got to interest UFO investigators. Witnesses came forward swearing aliens arrived. On a distant summer night, they said some died and some survived. Flying saucers been reported all across the 48. But who thought they'd hit the ground like a crumbled glasses plate? Folks swore they must be Martians who had come here to invade. But their only crash as dummies, so the Air Force 
Thus explain Crash as dummies Crash as dummies Crash as dummies Crash as dummies It was rumored they had big heads and four fingers on each hand Kinda looked more like a child than they did a grown-up man Locals they'd been threatened not to ever say a word Scared that they'd be ridiculed and made to look absurd Despite the passing years, government stories pretty rustic Hot air about balloons and up to spy upon the Ruskies okay. Throw in some crashed as dummies to explain the alien guys They must be the only ones to believe in their own lies Flying saucers been reported all across the 48 We thought they'd hit the ground like a crumpled license plate Our government reassures us nothing's happened secretly so my friends, no more loose ends, is everybody happy? Crash this dummies, 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 crash this dummies. They must think we're only crash this dummies. Despite the Air Force's preemptive strike, over 25,000 people made the pilgrimage to Roswell for the 4th of July week-long festivities. Reflecting small-town America in the 90s and our collective fascination with extraterrestrial visitation, Roswell became the focus of worldwide media attention. There was a discernible shift in the wind. The stigma of believing in UFOs had finally vanished. Now it was not only tolerated, it was cool and fun. America was passing through fear and denial on its way to acceptance and greater understanding. Returning to Roswell for the 50th anniversary celebration were the main UFO investigators who uncovered the case in the 80s. Kevin Randall, an Air Force Reserve officer who, with Don Schmidt of the J. Allen Hynek Center for UFO Studies, interviewed over 500 witnesses and wrote the definitive UFO crash at Roswell. Nuclear physicist Stanton T. Friedman, author of Crash at Corona and Top Secret Magic, was pivotal in first exposing the incident to the public. Uh, I was at a television station in Baton Rouge, Louisiana in 1978. Uh, a reporter was late. The station manager was entertaining me, giving me coffee, a little embarrassed because he knew I had a busy day. I was speaking that evening at Louisiana State University. Out of the blue, he says, uh, gee, you know, the guy you ought to talk to is Jesse Marcel. Who's he? Oh, well, he handled pieces of the wreckage of one of those saucers you're interested in when he was in the military. That got my attention, to say the least. Lives over in Houma, Louisiana, where old ham radio buddies. Well, the reporter shows up. Only time in my life I've been really glad somebody was late. And the next day I called Jesse from the airport. He told me a story, but he didn't have an exact date. And it was in evening papers from Chicago West. It gave us names. It gave us places... Uh, what you might describe as a, an overview of the story. It kept growing during the day, so different articles had different things. Uh, you know, you had headlines like this. This is a Chicago Daily News. Here's the Spokane Chronicle. Army declares flying disc found. My favorite is this one, which explains the dilemma we're in. Army finds flying saucer. General believes it is radar weather gadget. The cover story was already in late that same day. In the ensuing years, hundreds of witnesses, from relatives of deceased townspeople to retired army colonels, have come forth to verify that what crashed at Roswell was no balloon. 
Roswell has always been a challenge because so little information was there. I knew about this incident, not near as much as I know now, but I knew of this incident from credible sources before there was ever any books written on it. You know, I knew there was something to this. This is something that my own father told me that he believed happened and it wasn't a balloon, maybe military, but it wasn't a balloon, it was a lie. Colonel Edwin Easley, who was the Provost Marshal at Roswell in 1947, and for years telling us that he was still sworn to secrecy, he couldn't talk about this. And then just weeks before his passing from stomach cancer at Parkland Hospital in Dallas, and in the presence of Dr. Harold Granick and his two daughters and his grandchild wanting to present him with one final gift. And she walks up to the bed and holds up a copy of our first book to his face. And him turning away and going, oh, the creatures. And then for the first time, disclosing to his family how he was sworn to secrecy by the president, no less. And that he so regretted never being able to share this with his family. But he still didn't go any further. He still was a good soldier. What makes a good soldier? Now that the Cold War is over, many former U.S. military officers who were privy to top secret information about UFOs are choosing to set the record straight. At Roswell's 50th anniversary, the highest ranking officer yet, retired Colonel Philip Corso, released as much anticipated the day after Roswell in which he reports having actually witnessed one of the dead aliens while on duty at Fort Riley, Kansas in 1947. He later went on to serve in the National Security Council under President Dwight Eisenhower and in the Army's Research and Development Department under Lieutenant General Arthur Trudeau. Are the aliens still a threat and are there more than one uh, race coming here? Well, we thought that these aliens were homes built specifically for space travel. And they were part, many, many of our flying saucer experiments have failed because of the guidance system. We felt they were the guidance system. They were part of this group. And we also felt they were created by superior race. I think if scientists take takes a hand in it, they can look at what we know about the extraterrestrial. And we know quite a bit, but we don't know enough. Well, he's one of the most important UFO witnesses who's ever broken cover. We can't say for certain, I can't say for certain, whether everything he says is true, but I can say that he's got a heck of a pedigree and uh, that uh, it would be hard to imagine that he's just an outright liar at the end of his life when he's done so many other good things and has such a strong military background. So this is a man who says the Roswell incident is absolutely real. He saw the bodies. He saw the wreckage. He says the military has been dealing with the alien presence for years. The cover-up is real. It should end now. These are the things he's saying in this book. It's extraordinary. While at the Foreign Technology Desk at the Pentagon, Corso's secret mission was to feed American defense contractors like Bell Labs, IBM, Hughes Aircraft, and General Electric with alien components, which were then back-engineered into advanced weaponry that would eventually find its way to high-tech commercial applications. These are the lists that he said he personally was involved with General Trudeau getting into this industrial complex. Image intensifiers, which ultimately became night vision. Fiber optics, that was the description of what was inside of those hand-imprinted panels. Super tenacity fibers, this is what became things like Kevlar, according to him. Lasers, molecular alignment metallic alloys, integrated circuits and micro miniaturization of logic boards. I think Corso's book, uh, God bless that man for doing this at this point in his life, regardless of, uh, of the consequences, he lays out in the day after Roswell as clearly as anyone, and I've had so many people, always off the record, but people from intelligence and military who have tried to say, if you understood the conflicts between our own intelligence agencies and the military versus the intelligence agencies, you would begin to understand how a policy of silence and disinformation has continued to flourish. Well, it means that we have a kind of chaotic and competitive series of different intelligence and military uh, units 
each one holding on to their information from others. So I think that the next step, and I'm hoping that something's going to provoke this, how is the entire military and intelligence and industrial complex made comfortable for everybody to start sharing everything so that we could get on with the truth? Mip, mip, mip. You didn't see us. We don't exist. The truth is out there, reads the popular slogan from the X-Files television series. Is the wall of secrecy and intimidation surrounding Roswell and the UFO phenomenon starting to come down? The notorious and infamous female. Another ex-military officer who for years has been actively pushing for so full disclosure is former NATO Sergeant Major Robert Dean. And I think it's important to understand that I began as a no-nonsense, crew-cut, professional infantry type. I was not fantasy prone in any way. I was the kind of person who had to grab a hold of something and look at it, touch it, bite it, kick it, to believe it. But all that changed in 1963. I was assigned to one of those special military assignments we call plum assignments, and you get them once in a great while. I was able to take my family with me off to Paris, France for an assignment at uh, Supreme Headquarters Allied Powers in Europe. I arrived in 63, was immediately assigned to the war room, a place we call SHOC, Supreme Headquarters Operations Center. My top secret clearance was upgraded at that time to cosmic top secret, which was and still is the highest level of security classification that NATO has. And so I began working in the war room, and I began to hear discussions, comments, and it caught my attention. I was listening to them discussing a study that was initiated in 1961, two years before I arrived, and the subject was UFOs. And there apparently was a big, expensive, long-range NATO study underway to determine what was happening over the skies of Central Europe. Now, here's the problem. They were very obviously under intelligent control. They were very obviously incredibly technically capable. Their high speeds, their high altitude, the fact that they could turn on a dime and move and follow our jet fighters and fly rings around our bombers and fighters got the military very concerned. And in 1961, they initiated a study. The conclusions were that it had been going on for a long time. There were several groups involved. They were interested in us in some way. They had an extremely advanced technology. I pulled that out of the, the vault every chance I got. Every time I was on duty in Jacques, I'd pull it out and pull it out and read it. I'd go through it. I'd looked at the photographs. I looked at the reports, medical studies, met metallurgical analysis, autopsies. I couldn't put it down. They determined that God help us, happily, that these guys, whoever they were and wherever they were from, were not malevolent or hostile because if they had been, the, the level of technology that they repeatedly demonstrated was so far beyond anything we or the Soviets had that if they had been malevolent or hostile, it, 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 whatever it was would have been over a long time ago. Now that was the aspect that intrigued me quite a bit, the fact that there had been a long term, long-range survey of some kind taking place by several extraterrestrial intelligences. In recent years, as more testimonials and verified reports by credible witnesses have been gathered and publicized, material evidence has started to surface and fall into the hands of investigators capable of coordinating sophisticated scientific testing procedures. Producer of the Showtime television movie, Roswell, Paul Davids. That this morning there would be disclosure of scientific findings on debris that is purported to come from the Roswell crash, and that these findings are in some way definitive and conclusive as far as containing materials that are not of Earth origin. In August of 1995, I was contacted by an individual who claimed to have possession of what he stated was pieces of debris from the 1947 Roswell crash. After meeting with this individual, we began an extensive investigation into the history of the material and statements made by that source. 
Subsequently, after speaking with the individual at length, we learned that this material had been kept a secret for almost 50 years because of fear of ridicule and reprisal. It was not until after we received the preliminary metallurgical test results did we find the source to be credible and the material worthy of further research. After a year and a half of intensive research, scientists throughout the United States conducted a battery of laboratory tests which conclude that this material that you're now looking at appears to be manufactured structure and is extraterrestrial in origin. Here to present the laboratory results and to explain the testing procedures is Dr. Russell Vernon Clark. I, I personally conducted the first set of isotopic abundance tests. ICPMS is useful for determining uh, the composition and isotopic ratio. Uh, for an extremely wide variety of elements. Uh, in the case of the material that Daryl gave me, I took this uh, tenth of a milligram sample, uh, dissolved it in uh, nitric and hydrofluoric acids, then this liquid was sprayed into an argon plasma. The plasma causes the atoms to ionize. The ionized atoms are accelerated into a mass spectrometer. The mass spectrometer separates the ions according to their mass, and then they're detected you are in effect counting the numbers of the atomic nuclei that correspond to a specific isotope. By measuring the isotopic ratios of the artifacts trace elements, nickel, silver, zinc, and germanium, as well as the main element, silicon, Vernon Clark and other scientists working independently in similar test laboratories found striking variations never before encountered in naturally occurring Earth elements so striking, in fact, that they could not even originate from another planet in our solar system. Therefore, it should be considered that this material is both manufactured and extraterrestrial in origin. Okay, uh, please keep in mind that the, despite the lengthy discussion and technical scientific descriptions, these are extremely precise laboratory results. Uh, in the cases of ICPMS and uh, SIMS, we are essentially looking inside the atom uh, at the nuclei and weighing its contents. What goes up must come down, no matter how advanced it may be. Several ex-military sources have claimed that the Roswell incident is only one of many UFO crash retrieval events that have occurred since World War II. Whether initially shipped off to Wright-Patterson, Edwards, or Langley, Many of these downed saucers allegedly found their way to the ultra-top-secret test facility in Nevada, known as Area 51. Here, where Bob Lazar claims to have attempted to back-engineer alien propulsion systems, fantastic stories continue to bubble to the surface. After 25 years of silence, David Adair, now a space technology transfer consultant, has come forward with his amazing experience during the summer of 1971. I was uh, 13 years old when I built my first rocket and it left the backyard at about 3,500 miles an hour. I was able to build it out of a construction uh, machine shop that my father owned when he used to work for uh, the mechanics and racing enterprises and we had plenty of um, equipment and tools that allow such manufacturing to be done. The rockets kept getting bigger, faster, uh, till finally I was able to uh, get funded by a federal grant by a, a congressman named John Ashbrook. And with that help, I was able to go ahead and complete a larger rocket with an entirely new type of engine, which was a fusion containment engine. In simple essence, it's able to create a f magnetic field capable of holding a thermal fusion reaction inside, like a chunk of the sun contained in a magnetic bottle. And when you tap that power, it allows you to have tremendous uh, thrust, which is what makes the rocket go forward. So once the engine was, um, and the rocket was completed, we uh, obviously couldn't launch it where I was launching smaller rockets, which were out in cow fields in uh, Ohio. So we had to go to uh, White Sands, New Mexico, and that was uh, arranged by the congressman and a consultant at the time who was a retired general named Curtis LeMay. They instructed me to send the rocket down 656 miles northwest of there to a precise set of coordinates that they gave me. And I asked them, why are we landing in a dry lake bed? And uh, 
in Nevada, and they said, uh, just drop it there, and I said, I can do that. So we fired a rocket, and it was a really success as far as engines go. Extremely fast, it was so fast you couldn't even see it leave. So we got on the plane, and when we got there, uh, they were right, there were twin 10,000-foot runways there and hangars and a 42,000-acre Air Force base called Groom Lake. My rocket was down on the south end of the field at the end of the runways, and you could see the parachutes um, bellowing in the wind, and we landed and got out. And um, I was assuming we were going to go look at my rocket right then. Uh, no, we got in golf carts and rode to the center hangar, which was a very low, flat-type hangar, but extremely large inside, about the size of about four football fields. So we pull in there and stop in these little golf carts, and we're just sitting there. And I'm going, well, that hangar's empty. I thought, this is interesting, you know. And then a few minutes, uh, little yellow and red lights came on flashing. And um, then out of the ground or out of the, out of the floor come these little rails with chains on them. And they came up around all the doorways. And then the entire floor dropped out from under us. It's an elevator. We went down about 20 stories. And in the work bays, um, we went down to one that had uh, something sitting in, uh, in one of the big workshops. They pulled the big covers off this thing, and um, it was interesting. It's an engine that's about the size of a school bus. And this engine is a much larger version of the thing I built. It's also an electric magnetic fusion containment engine, but it is sophisticated and it is powerful. I would have to compare mine to it. it. would be like I had a Model A, and this thing was a Ferrari. I mean, it's just a tremendous, powerful difference. But we both were of the same engine breed. And um, this one had been damaged right in the center of the core. They asked me to look at it and describe to them how I thought the thing functioned. And I asked them, um, you know, how come um, I'm telling you about your engine? And they said that the engine was recovered in a um, project they was working with, and they weren't sure how the, everything functioned on it, and um, personnel that were available to work on that was not available anymore. And they said, could, if I could just help them out a little bit. Well, being 17 years old at the time, um, they uh, thought I didn't pick up on too many adult innuendos, but I was, I guess I was born old. I knew exactly what they were doing. So I said, fine, you know, yeah, I'll be glad to help my country, you know. Yeah. So we play along, and I asked them, can I walk up to it? And they said, sure, as a matter of fact, you can climb on it if you want. So I got up to the engine. When I put my hands on the engine to pull myself up on it, this really interesting swirl pattern would come off wherever my skin was touching, and they would swirl out through the metal, going out through the, through the alloy. And I, I didn't know of any metal that could do that. So I turned around and told them um, about this firing system here. And they were going, yeah, wh where is the firing system? And I started to tell them that because I, f I finally figured out what this thing was doing. But then I said, well, why am I telling you about your own firing system if all this is yours? And you got, this isn't from here, is it? Matter of fact, it ain't from around the area, is it, boys? And they uh, started getting upset. I said, let's do some assumptions. This is an engine. I'm assuming it came out of a craft, a big one, by the size, proportional differences, probably 300 feet plus, you know, the length of a football field. Well, therefore, it's got occupants. Why in God's name have you done with them? Well, that was the wrong thing to say because they are up on the engine coming after me, and it's time to leave. Well, when I bend down to get off the engine, I put my hands back on the engine. Something interesting. Instead of the nice smooth wave lines, they were now look like small tornadoes coming off all my fingertips, moving through the metal. And then I realized what this thing was. Uh, they grabbed hold of me, the Air Force guys did. We got back in the golf cart and we were riding back up to the surface. And I was sitting there thinking, I just realized what this engine is. It's a symbiotic engine. The engine is alive. It is an engine that's capable, the reason they couldn't figure out the firing order is that the tubing that was cascading all over its body looked like the same pattern you would have from a brain stem of a neurosynaptic ordering firing order. 
So what's happening is when the pilots sit down their seats, their thought waves drive the engine. Adair isn't the first nor the only person whose claims of living organic alien technology have started to filter out of the secret military aerospace black operations. William McDonald worked with Tester's company to design an authentic model based on the recovered Roswell craft. In 1993, I was hired as the concept designer to the movie Roswell. And after completing that assignment, I decided to find out what the real spacecraft and the real bodies looked like, having nothing to do with the film. My research took me into a four-year journey of interviewing military officers and other researchers who supplied with me the data that I needed to do full forensic composites of what the flight crew and the spacecraft looked like that crashed at Roswell on July 4th, 1947 at 11 o'clock in the evening. Much to my surprise, it was not a disc. It was a winged vehicle, a wave rider, one of those lifting body, transatmospheric, high-speed recon type of vehicles. It was amazing what we came up with. It was extremely unique. We found out many years later that everybody, including Ben Rich, knew that this vehicle had been the design Rosetta Stone, the holy grail of aerospace designs, we found that inside this vehicle had microprocessors that looked like the neuroganglia tissue that you see in a human brain. The entire vehicle was found to have biomorphic characteristics, those being called biomagnetic or biomimicry. This vehicle, when by itself exhibited artificial intelligence, but when you plugged all seven flight crew members into all seven flight crew stations, you had an interface between their physical bodies and the neurological structure of the spacecraft, which was exotic metal and non-organic components, mostly crystalline metals in exotic mixtures. That way, the vehicle became, in essence, akin to a living being with multiple brain nodes. Are some UFOs our own military's back-engineered experimental craft? was the Strategic Defense Initiative, Star Wars, part of a concerted effort to level the playing field by deploying a space-based shield to track and shoot down UFOs. If so, does this imply, as Corso and others have claimed, that the nations of Earth, led by the United States, have been engaged in a covert war against one or more extraterrestrial civilizations? As phenomenal as this may seem, Billions of dollars continue to be funneled into black budgeted programs to develop exotic weapons and defensive systems, which on face value are light years beyond what would be necessary to ward off any terrestrial threat, communist or otherwise. Strong evidence of the U.S. military's success in replicating alien technology has begun to leak out from the Air Force's highest security installations. This tape, which was smuggled out of the Nellis Air Force test range in late 1994, it's on U.S. government tracking cameras and U.S. government radar units. Throughout the range, which is a bombing range, they have different sites with a remote control camera and a radar unit. These sites are controlled by civilian contract workers who are not classified. So when black budgeted crafts are flying on the range, these sites are all shut down. At this time, for some reason, they're open. And we have an object starting at S-13 that these people are unable to identify. 18 degrees, 18.6 degrees elevation, 10.8 degrees or kilometers range. We're going to put a large jump on it anyway and see what happens. It seems to be hovering there. We'll call this a kill on this unknown aircraft. Termination kill means they have locked radar on the object. This is exactly what you go through before they launch a missile at it. It's now doing some very strange things. It's moving back and forth because it's a joystick control camera and they're trying to keep up with it. And they're now coming into the S-30 site. The object the radar, as you can now see, is being jammed by the craft. If you look at it closely, 
you will actually see a fluctuation around it. This is this immense field. And at one point in here, you'll hear him say, I think we have a helo. This is no healer you've ever seen in your life. At this stage, we really start seeing the field. And this object is moving at an incredible rate of speed. The term non-flare, which you're hearing in the background, means that they're at telling them, ordering them to shut their units down. This is all United States technology. They concluded in 1975 and 76 that some of the more advanced races that we were dealing with, that we had had communication with, that we had had contact with, were apparently multidimensional in their source. Now we're talking about intelligences, we're talking about races that are so far beyond us, not only in technology, but in, in evolution, in their spiritual understanding. And it became very apparent to me that this was far more important than the hardware. Where are they from? Why are they here? I, I began to realize that the spiritual aspect of this was, for me at least, the most important part of it. I stopped being skeptical, but I became more curious than I'd ever been in my life. I learned along the way that we weren't simply dealing with visitation from high-tech extraterrestrial civilizations. The study inferred and concluded in many areas that something was going on, a process or a plan of some kind was unfolding. They didn't know what it was in 1964, and I'm frank with you in telling you that I don't think they even know now what their agenda may be. But believe me, they have an agenda. I make only one assumption about every advanced civilization, namely it's concerned with its own survival and security. That seems reasonable to me, if we look around our own planet. That being the case, you have to keep tabs on the primitives in the neighborhood, but only close tabs on those primitives who show signs of being able to bother you. At the end of World War II, there were three signs to any horrified visitor who noted that we killed 50 million of our own kind, destroyed 1,700 cities, not a very nice society. But there were three signs that soon would be taking our brand of friendship, hostility, out. Nuclear weapons, powerful V-2 rockets, and powerful radar, a new method of you know, producing radio waves and all that sort of stuff. You put them all together, they say, within 100 years, which isn't very long on a cosmic timescale, Earthlings would be moving out. Now, I don't find it any coincidence at all that the only place on planet Earth where you could study all three of those technologies in July 1947 was right here in southeastern New Mexico. Different alien civilizations most likely have competing agendas not unlike the bickering nations on planet Earth. Yet not one of them has blatantly announced themselves to the planet at large with irrefutable proof of their existence. Frustrating to say the least for the media reporters and UFO investigators. Because of this, debunkers are legitimized and the government's deniability is maintained to this day, despite what many are beginning to perceive is an ongoing gradual indoctrination process designed to prepare mankind for the inevitable day of official recognition and the sudden shock of first contact. I cannot decide uh, to my own satisfaction whether there is any orchestrated effort or agenda toward lessening that cover-up. But it does seem as if the people of America are being prepared, again, whether by accident or design, I cannot be sure. But I think that we have come from a time only a decade or two ago when the idea, for example, of alien abduction was so outrageous it was appalling and, and terrifying to where a lot of people more or less take it for granted and try to see the, you know, the silver lining 
You know, oh, that's going to happen. It does, you know, it happens to me, it happens to my wife, whatever. Uh, and um, that's an enormous uh, change. Have the aliens helped to create that? Well, I think they have. They, they must have. Uh, if, uh, I have to assume, A, aliens are real, B, they are interacting with us, and C, they have some kind of overview of how it is that uh, our interaction will evolve. I think that, that I've only seen one particular alien agenda, and that is this abducting people, a uh, strong interest in human emotion, in, in the way we care for our children, the bonding we can do with our, our own offspring, these very human things, human sexuality, and of course the taking of sperm and ova samples and uh, an apparent attempt to, to create a hybrid mix. I think this is central to whatever the effort is, and I think there might be different races or different types involved, but they're all cooperating in this particular project. I would say probably 80% of the cases and interviews of people that I have uh, interviewed over at least a decade and a half the one common denominator was concern about the planet's future environmentally. There were all of these scenarios about something really catastrophic happening globally. A lot of the implications were that the human race actually as a species might not survive. You stand back from it and you say, if you're dealing with an advanced intelligence that appears to be harvesting tissue from animals, appears to be interacting with plants, probably harvesting genetic material from humans. There's an agenda there. And when the abductions uh, themselves, when the abductees themselves say that their impression is that the non-human intelligence has a survival issue, and that there is some symbiotic relationship between whatever this advanced intelligence is and our own planet, and what they are harvesting is genetic material, it raises some major questions. Would the visions or images or projections of some sort of catastrophic event on this planet actually be a way of scaring humans into realizing that if we kept on the environmentally destructive paths we're on, we could end up destroying our own planet, which would destroy us? Because whatever this alien intelligence is, it seems to have a vested interest in keeping life going on this planet. He's dead, yeah. His eyes are kind of open, Mom. Here we are in Roswell, which many people think of as the beginning of the UFO phenomenon. Well, the UFO phenomenon has been going on for a long, long time, uh, probably centuries. In fact, when you begin to look back and um, you know, medieval history, we find representations of things that look surprisingly like discs and spaceships uh, woven into 12th century tapestries, um, uh, 14th century frescoes. Uh, in Yugoslavia, for example, there's literally something that looks surprisingly like a spaceship with a little man in it uh, that's chasing another little man who's looking back over his shoulder in another spaceship capsule. Uh, looks just like rocket ships. That's just really in our recent historical past. When we begin to go back even further, we discover that some of the, um, the legends that have been passed down to us about the Greek gods and the, the Norse gods, and you know, there have been gods in almost every single civilization, and they're surprisingly similar. That's one of the things that's most interesting about them. It's God, Kukulkan, Quetzalcoatl, Wiracocha, the other old Maya gods, the Inca gods, the gods from the Hopi Indians, the so-called Kachinas, the teachers from heaven, the gods in ancient Egypt. I think these were all the same beings. Maybe the different people around the earth didn't even saw them. It's quite possible, like the example with Christianity, that it happened only at two or three places. And then the talking started. Oh, it was a great time. They descended from the sky. And now the people start to make their uh, sculpture and their artifacts and so on. 
many of them that are uh, overseeing our planet now have interacted with it historically uh, in uh, some very large and some small ways. They've influenced our religions. Um, they have probably directly inspired many of the mystical or paranormal um, encounters that uh, holy men like Mohammed and Moses and many of these uh, biblical prophets have had in the past, you know, the Ezekiel chariots of fire. Gods do not exist. There is only one God, I'm, and I'm personally still a deep believer in God. I'm one of these figures who's praying every day. But in antiquity, thousands of years ago, extraterrestrials visited this planet. Our forefathers then did not understood what was going on. They knew nothing about space technology or technology in our sense. So they believed that these beings are the gods. Naturally, there are no gods, but it was a misunderstanding. So they believed these must be the gods. So it was handed down in the religions, in the traditional textbooks and so on. I even take one step further. I'm absolutely convinced that these extraterrestrials created human intelligence by a deliberate mutation. When you look at the anthropological and archaeological table, we literally see that um, as we've gone along from Osteopithecus to um, Java Man to uh, Homo erectus and then to Cro-Magnon, that there is a leap directly from Cro-Magnon into Homo sapiens sapien, which is what we are now, that uh, only entailed a hundred year span, which in anthropological terms is impossible. We have extraterrestrial genes in us, and after a certain time, the program is decoded and opens into the brain. We now have started a sort of cosmic consciousness. We realize that we are not alone. Until now, we have a very egocentric believing. We believe that we are unique in the universe. Something like us never exists. We look down at the navel. We are the greatest, whatever. So now we start to change this position. We start to open our consciousness through the universe. And I believe this is because of the extraterrestrial genes which are in us. And I find myself agreeing with Von Dadink that it's been going on for at least 400,000 years. And my own conclusions over the last 30 years, I've pretty well concluded that the human race is indeed a hybrid race, that we have very likely been seeded here on this planet, and that I have concluded that we have been continually genetically manipulated on this planet for the last several hundred thousand years. And it's still going on. That process is still underway. There was an enormous object hovering over Phoenix, Arizona for an hour and 40 minutes. They did computer analysis of what they had on the video cameras and they determined that this object was 2,000 yards across. I predict you're going to see a lot more of that because our friends, our family, I think, are going to continue to up the ante slowly, gently, in a non-threatening kind of way. And you can see like a, a ball going around it. I mean, way out around it, you know. There ain't no little airplane that moves five miles in two seconds. <laughs> I think that one of the reasons that the extraterrestrial uh, encounters seem to be increasing on an exponential level and are going to continue to increase through the millennium and, and, and until the end of this age is because we really are at a very pivotal point in Earth's history. Certainly environmentally, we're doing disastrous things to the planet and you don't have to be a rocket scientist to see it. But one of the reasons that they are returning, uh, as I see it, has to do with the vibration of the planet herself. You know, we've been vibrating about 7.8 pulses per second, all sentient life on the planet, the plants, the animals, the humans. We don't even notice it. But what has been happening really is that the, the number of pulses per second is increasing. We're now up at around 11.2 pulses. That's why a lot of people feel like time is speeding up. It actually is speeding up. Um, we are vibrating at a faster speed as we move uh, from the third into the fourth density uh, vibrational patterns. And that's true of everything on the planet. And when that happens, several things occur 
the millennium changes, the age of Pisces comes to an end and the age of Aquarius fully comes into place. The Mayan calendar ends and all of the prophecies, um, the Nostradamus prophecies of the destruction and then the thousand years of peace comes in. We're at a time when anything could happen. It's a very exciting time to be alive on the planet. We're going to reach a point in a, within just a few years where there are major changes and major new inventions and enormous changes in the weather and in society and in the way people live and think about each other almost on a daily basis. Now, for a long time, the Christians have been teaching the four horsemen of the apocalypse. You know, famine, war, pestilence, whatever. And oh my, we're doomed. It's the end of the world. The Greek word apocalypse simply means the uncovering, the disclosure, and the revealing. And I say to people, I says, you're smack dab in the middle of the apocalypse right now. Because the four horsemen have been riding for the last 5,000 years. There isn't a time in history where we haven't had famine and wars and pestilence and such. So I'm not terribly worried about the apocalypse. I know that I'm living through it, and I'm excited about it. I'm going through, and you're going through, and everyone out there is experiencing the uncovering, the disclosure, and the revealing. I can tell you from what little I know about the small transformation that I have experienced, on the other side of this is a, a new kind of peace, a new kind of love for your fellow man, a understanding of what compassion really means, uh, all kinds of extraordinary psychic abilities, a different type of health and a different way of relating to the physical world and your body's place in it. It's a whole different way of living. Ironically, the leaders in this are going to be the children. Our children will take us into this new world. We will follow them into it. In a nation founded on freedom, the truth cannot be denied forever. Ready or not, humanity is being drawn into the realization that we are part of a vast galactic neighborhood teeming with intelligent life. Whether you call it disclosure, the revealing, or the uncover-up, this wondrous process has irreversibly begun. How we integrate this knowledge within ourselves, overcoming our fears, and trusting in the wisdom and spiritual insights we glean will permanently alter our way of life, yet also propel our evolutionary destiny toward the stars.